Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a very special day as we welcome the Grand Chief Sean Ann Chudatlio to give the LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium here in Stratford. But before we begin, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Anthony Cimolino. I'm the Artistic Director of the Stratford Festival. And <laughs> thank you. So as we begin, I'd like to welcome two artists to the stage to start today's event. Lee Claremont is Mohawk and Irish and was born in Woodstock and on the territory of the Grand River Six Nations, Ontario. And she's a visual artist of international renown, including a commission to represent Canada at the Pan Am Games in Toronto in 2015. And some of her work is currently on display in Stratford at the Gallery Indigena, so I encourage you to go out and see that she's been here for a number of days setting everything up, hanging it, so please go out and have a look. She now resides in British Columbia, and so we're especially honored that she has come all this way and agreed to give an opening blessing for today's event. James Adams is a multidisciplinary artist. He's a storyteller, he's a writer, he's an educator, and he's a performance artist of Mohawk, Cree, Innu, and Anglo-Saxon heritage. He led part of a storytelling workshop here in Stratford as part of our forum back in July, and he's generously agreed uh, to come in today and help us start things off. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James and Lee. Wache, edition of Ka Kakitiwi Masqua Sawanok Kaote, Dorem Kihi O. My name is Black Bear Man who walks from the south. I am a Cree and a Mohawk, and my clan is of the Eagle, and I am very proud and honored and humbled to be here to sing for you today. The song I would like to sing was gifted to me by this rattle. I made this rattle for my son when he was two months old, and it gave me his song that I sing to him every night before he sleeps. And with his permission, I will use his rattle and his song to open these festivities. myself Moorish. So um, there's a lot of Mohawk Irish on uh, the reserve. 
I, um, I won't speak much other than give the blessing, but I have a story that happened this morning, so I thought I should share it. And I've been carrying this little folder around ever since I've been here. I mean, everywhere I go, I've got this folder, and down by the river, and because I'm trying to put together something for this blessing, because it's so important. And um, this morning, I went out for a coffee, and, or to get a coffee and bring it back so I could look at my folder again. And I got back and I, I had forgotten the folder. And then all of a sudden the creator just said to me, it was a lesson, forget the folder. <laughs> just go out there and speak from your heart. So it is um, my blessing to be able to give the blessing to this great event. So uh, if you could please stand. Great Creator, we are all gathered here to seek understanding and um, begin to know each other in a way that is positive and, um, and go on to higher spots with, for, for more discourse within um, all, all of our, our, our nations and our fellow Canadians um, with joy and passion. I'm sure you, Creator, have made us all loving and just want to be one big family and we're all so lucky to live in the country of Canada and I'm very very thrilled and honored that you have helped us put together this very great forum all my relations thank you Thank you, Lee and James. What a magnificent way to start. Now, as you may be aware, um, this is my first season as artistic director at the Stratford Festival, and in putting together this season, I put together a series of plays that examined a theme, an idea, and the idea centers around communities, what makes up communities, what happens when communities divide, and where is the place of the outsider, what happens to the outsider when communities divide. And to support the exploration of that theme, not only in our playbill, but with our audiences in interactivity, I put together a forum. There are over 150 different events that range from comedy nights, talks, speeches, concerts, that explore that idea and take it further, and to see how these ideas play out in our playbill. So to this end, we're thrilled, I am thrilled, that we are able to partner with the Institute for Canadian Citizenship to present this year's La Fontaine Baldwin Symposium in Stratford as part of our inaugural forum. The ICC, with its mandate of fostering a culture of engaged citizens, is a natural partner for the forum. The La Fontaine Baldwin Symposium, which is the ICC's intellectual platform, is a national interactive lecture on citizenship, and we're delighted especially delighted to have as the first speaker here in Stratford, National Chief Sean A. Einschut Atlio of the Assembly of First Nations, to have his voice included in our exploration and understanding of community. Now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you the organization's founders and co-chairs, the Right Honourable Adrian Clarkson and John Rostin Saul. Adrian Clarkson is universally acknowledged for transforming the office of the Governor General. The energy, enthusiasm, and knowledge of Canada that she shared in her six years in Ottawa left an indelible mark on our nation's history. A leading figure in Canada's cultural life, Madam Clarkson has had a rich and a distinguished career in broadcasting, in journalism, the arts, and in public service. An eminent writer, her latest book, Room for All of Us, recounts the stories of 10 successful Canadians who lost everything and rebuilt their lives in Canada. Her work has been recognized with dozens of awards in Canada, the United States, and abroad, including 26 honorary doctorates, and that has to be some sort of record. <laughs> anyway, we're honored to have her join us today. A celebrated essayist and novelist, John Ralston Saul's philosophical tri trilogy and its conclusion, Voltaire's Bastards, The Doubter's Companion, The Unconscious Civilization, and On Equilibrium, The Six Qualities of the New Humanism, have impacted political thought in many countries. In a fair country, 
telling truths about Canada, he argues that modern Canada is profoundly shaped by Aboriginal ideas. Both John and Adrian's books are available for sale in the lobby following this event. And as I always say, there's nothing that wins you greater uh, warmth than a writer's heart than buying their book. <laughs> John is the president of Penn International and the founder and honorary chair of French for the Future. He is a companion of the Order of Canada and a chevalier ne les ordres des arts et des lettres de France. His many literary awards include Chile's Pablo Neruda Award, the Governor General's Award, the inaugural Gutenberg Galaxy Award. It is my privilege to welcome him here today. I will let John introduce the National Chief, and if you find, want to find out more about the ICC, there is, of course, a website and there's more information in your program. I will now call on Adrian Clarkson to tell you more about the organization herself. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson. Thank you very much, Anthony, and I want to thank the Stratford Festival for partnering with the Institute for Canadian Citizenship in this wonderful forum um, on community, and uh, we do have an identity of interests, and I'm really happy that we are together today on this wonderful day in Stratford. The ICC was uh, something that I wanted to found as I was leaving Ottawa because as the first immigrant to become Governor General, I felt it was important to help others who uh, have come to this country as little children or as adults and chosen to become Canadians, that they have the chance to be part of Canadian life, not just by having jobs and living okay, but by having an imprint by leaving their mark, by becoming something in this country that everybody wants to be, that whatever goal they chose, there would be nothing standing in their way, that we would be inclusive for everybody, because we realize that people coming from, from other countries bring different values, they bring their experiences, and they come here, and we become enriched by this wealth of new perspective, new ideas, and how we all benefit from them. I have, I have always wanted to make sure that we in this country are encouraged to think about ourselves first and foremost as belonging to Canada, that we are Canadian citizens because we belong and we share values, the public and ethical values that this country was built upon and continues to believe in. When I was little, people were very kind to us in Canada. I have only, as I pointed out in my autobiography, only the best stories to tell. We came to Canada during the crisis of the Second World War. We were refugees. We had nothing. The Anglican Church was extremely kind to us because we were Anglicans, and I think like a lot of immigrants, churches help, help people, first and foremost. And I remember people saying to my parents, and we'd hear it, don't worry, Bill Nethel, you know, your kids will be Canadian in one generation. And my father would say to us after, one generation's too late. You're going to become Canadians now. Everything will be yours now. And so we worked hard for that, and we did it. We have a lot of institutions in this country that work very hard for newcomers, that work very hard for immigrants, for refugees, uh, for teaching people la the, the languages of our country. But I felt that once we became Canadian citizens, we kind of dropped people. So we have three programs at the ICC. We have this LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium, which is our intellectual uh, platform for talking about citizenship, inclusion. And we have a wonderful program of, uh, called Building Citizenship, which is volunteer groups across the country having special citizenship ceremonies where we have roundtables and discussions about what it is like for new citizens to live in this country, and then they become citizens right after that discussion. And our very successful program, the Cultural Access Pass, We've had more than 70,000 participants to date, and that is a pass is given to every single new Canadian, not just at our ceremonies, but to some 2,900 ceremonies across the country, to all new citizens that they can belong to nearly 1,500 cultural 
uh, places in Canada where they will be welcomed for free for one year with their family of up to four children. And I'm very happy that we have in our audience today uh, a number of our CAP participants. We are really, really thrilled that this has taken off as such, and we are also thrilled that Via Rail gives 50% off its lowest uh, advertised price to CAP holders. The thing is good all across the country, and it fill, fills in very much that idea that you, can, you cannot belong to a country unless you know in, about it, unless you want to be part of it, unless you have that sense that you are welcomed into it. And all the institutions that have welcomed our CAP holders, they are part of our building citizenship. We are delighted with our partnership for Stratford. We are, with Stratford, we are happy that we have this lecture here with the National Chief, Sean Atlio, whom we have known uh, for a number of years and who we feel uh, is going to be able to tell us in a very interesting and provocative way what it means to belong in this country, what it is that we are looking for in this country. And I want to say to everyone who has helped to organize this, Magwitch, thank you. And now John, my fellow co-chair, is taking it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony and, and uh, Adrian. Uh, it's a great thrill to be here doing this in Stratford for the first time. Uh, I want to thank the drum and James Adams. I want to thank Elder Lee Claremont. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we're on Six Nations territory. Uh, these protocols are very important, and it took me years to learn to thank not the drummer, but the drum, because the drum is, a, is, is in and of itself something. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 11th LaFontaine Baldwin Lecture, the first here in Stratford. Welcome to those who are watching this via the webcast. I should tell you also that there's an online conversation taking place during this lecture. I half understand what I just said. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the question period, we are going to be monitoring questions coming in uh, through that conversation. We'll try to take some of those questions along with those of you who are in the audience. So you have to be patient if you're in line and someone butts in and says, I have a question from somebody in Whitehorse. That's okay. That's good. Um, and we'll try to get as many as we can. And if we don't, we'll deal with them perhaps online afterwards. Ça va se passer aujourd'hui plutôt en anglais. Mais s'il y a des francophones qui veulent poser les questions en français, n'hésitez pas, je, je vais jouer le traducteur, euh, que vous soyez ici ou ailleurs, faites ça en français. I want to say, as I've said for 11 lectures, welcome to CBC Radio and Ideas, because this is being recorded and will air on that great, great program, Ideas, on September 4th. This lecture has traveled all over the country, Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver. Did I say Toronto or not allowed to? Yes, Toronto. Um, <laughs> it's been given by astonishing Canadians, Chief Justice uh, Beverly McLaughlin, Louise Arbour, George Erasmus, one of, the, of Chief Atlio's great predecessors as National Chief. Last lecture, the 10th, was given by His Highness the Aga Khan in Toronto, and the 9th was given in Iqaluit, the first ever national lecture given in the Arctic. It was incredibly exciting by Silawat Cloutier. Um, these have all been historic events. They've played a role in changing the way Canadians think. This will be the third time that one of our important Aboriginal leaders has given it out of 11. Um, so why is it called the LaFontaine Baldwin Lecture for those of you who have not been to one before? Well, because the ideas it's, it comes out of the ideas of LaFontaine and Baldwin and the great ministry which they oversaw, and Joseph Howe, who was their equivalent in the Maritimes, out of the 1840s, 1850s. The great ministry was in power from 1848 to 1851. And in three years, it set the direction for the modern idea of Canada, the modern humanist idea of Canada, the ethical idea, the pluralist idea, the idea of Canada at its best. We also have our moments when we're at our worst, like all countries. Um, it's interesting, the ICC uh, and this lecture, because 
Lafontaine and Baldwin and the reformers were brought to power, the democratic movement were brought to power because of the Irish refugee crisis of 1847, when the population of Toronto was tripled in three months with people with communicable diseases and dying, and the mistreatment and the mishandling of the Irish refugee crisis in the summer of 1847 led a, a critical mass of people in Upper Canada to switch from voting for the family compact, the anti-democratic people, to voting in the January 1848 election for democracy. So it was in fact an immigration failure that led to the arrival of democracy in Canada in eight, early 1848. And the first act of the first democratic government of Canada in February or March, in February, they did it before they actually took power, but they controlled parliament. Their first act as the democratic majority in Canada was to bring in an immigration law, to tell the English to get lost when it came to emigration and to create an immigration policy for Canada which would be fair and just. Those are the roots of Canadian immigration and citizenship policy which the ICC works for at its best coming out of the great ministry. So in three years in power they put through hundreds of laws which shaped the Canada we know they put in place the beginnings of an open and fair justice system, the beginnings of a public education system, of a professional civil service. They put in place the two key things that would end the possibility of the French and English class, European class structures and systems, which is to say they did away with English primogenitor and began the doing away with of the French seniorial system. They made free use of roads, they created an egalitarian postal system because before then you had to have money to send messages. Uh, they removed from the law imprisonment for debt. They created the public university system with the University of Toronto, which is the beginning of our public system. Um, and uh, more and more and more. They shaped this country in three years for the best. And the idea of this lecture is to take that humanist past and say where can we go in the future with this inclusive egalitarian idea of Canada. And so it was logical when Adrian principally and myself set up the Institute for Canadian Citizenship that the already existing Lafontaine Baldwin Symposium would come under its wing. And when we sat down a year ago with Anthony and uh, Stratford, it was immediately logical to us that the Lafontaine Baldwin Lecture and Symposium would come here to be part and work with the Festival of Stratford. Um, so this is the ICC's national intellectual platform on citizenship, democracy, and the common good. Um, Lafontaine and Baldwin represent one part of that, of the legal, political, and philosophical beginnings of Canadian pluralism. But the other part, which precedes that, which is the founding part, is of course the incredible contribution made by Indigenous peoples. There with the Indigenous peoples you find the founding pillar of the three founding pillars of modern Canada. And the last hundred years have been very difficult on this front, uh, very, very difficult, but they have also witnessed an incredible, long, difficult, but incredible comeback of Aboriginal peoples to their proper place of influence and growing influence in Canada, a reuniting of the influence of the first hundreds of years with their influence today. And National Chief Sean Anschut Atlio is himself a sign of that comeback. He and his predecessors like George Erasmus, Ovid Mercady, Matthew Kuncom, Phil Fontaine are all part of this extraordinary new First Nations, Métis, Inuit leadership which are reshaping Canada to put us back in line with our origins, with our humanist origins. I first met the National Chief five years ago in Vancouver when he was then the elected representative of the BC Chiefs on the National Council and I was, we had dinner together and then we did a thing in a theater and I found him fascinating. It was clear that this was a new voice, a new way of saying things from an indigenous point of view but a Canadian point of view also, a kind of optimism in spite of all the difficulties, a man filled with ideas, a new voice for First Nations, but also as a Canadian, I would say, a possible new voice for all of us. The National Chief's full biography is in the playbill, so I would just say this, that uh, National Chief 
Sean Anshut Atlio, he's a hereditary chief of the Ahauset First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. July 2012, he was re-elected, elected to a second consecutive three-year term as national chief by the Assembly of First Nations. He's put an incredible emphasis on the importance of education. He's traveled across the country endlessly and tirelessly. And as you know, the last six months have seen a new chapter in Indigenous people speaking out all across this country, and Chief Atlio has been at the center of this. He is an invaluable and historic turning point voice for Indigenous peoples, First Nation people, and I think for all of us. Please welcome National Chief Sean Anschut Atlio to the stage to give the 11th LaFontaine Baldwin Symposium Lecture on First Nations and the future of Canadian citizenship. Oneida, Chippewa, Delaware, Ma Chinopsik, Ma Tikitsu, Tlakish Beat Ma As. Chachum Hasa, Chachum Hasa. It's good to be alive this morning. <laughs> I carry the name, as I said in my language, A Inchat, which my wife and I were hoping we'd be bestowed a name, I would be bestowed a name, something like Eagle Flies Soars in the Blue Sky. <laughs> but A Inchat translates as the people depend on you. And as John had uh, offered up in his very generous introduction, I come from an old system of governance in my little village of Ahauset, which is a fishing village. If any of you know the west coast of Vancouver Island, that's where I come from. I was just there yesterday, day before yesterday. And uh, you can't get any further west on this continent than Ahauset. It's, uh, as a child, we would find little glass fishing balls that had floated over from Japan. So next stop, Japan, I always say when I, when I think about home. And as is the rightful thing to do, as John had expressed, expressed in our protocol that whenever outside of our territories, the language that I just spoke, one of 52 indigenous languages uh, in Canada. And in my role as national chief, I support and advocate for all 52 languages, coast to coast to coast. Join in the acknowledgement of my Métis and Inuit indigenous brothers and sisters, and also to Nuk Nuk, giving expression of appreciation for the ceremony this morning, always is the way of our people. We reflect and respect that somebody else's laws are here, and the song has been sung, and the prayer has been offered, the elders have spoken, now we can get on with our business. And that includes uh, she who carries the, the great name from Treaty 7 territories, from the bloods. She carries the name Grandmother of Many Nations, our former Governor General. <laughs> that, uh, that name, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about it. But Her Excellency, Honorable Madame Clarkson, the role that she held, uh, our people through the bloods gave expression to our feeling about the crown in bestowing that name on, on you. And I want to thank you and John for the very kind invitation, as, uh, along with uh, Anthony uh, and the organizers here at Stratford. It is a tremendous honor, and I was speaking with Lee before she came to do the ceremony. And let me begin with this sentiment, what she expressed to me. She said, it feels like we're on the cusp. And so let me begin there. 
with that, with that sentiment. Being so thankful to be here, and I know that many of you will be enjoying the artistic brilliance and creativity, and this notion of inviting this lecture to be a part of this is something personally I feel deeply grateful for. Never could we imagine if I were to hold a potlatch where a name would be bestowed or a marriage concluded or a rite of passage or even a funeral without going to the artistic leadership. We would never call them anything less than because they're a part of the fabric of our systems of governance over the course of history. And so too, shouldn't we consider the artists as leaders amongst us? So I think about the John Ralston Sauls when he's offering up important thoughts for the country through his writings or the artists we had a chance to sit down and spend some time with last night. Award-winning playwright, uh, Tara, I don't know if Tara's here this morning. Oh, there you are. <laughs> and the way you described it, Tara, for, for Tara, my daughter's name is Tara too. Uh, the way Tara described it as an award-winning playwright, talking about those who had dug the trenches so that we, as I, if I can say, as contemporaries, as the next generation, so that we can fight on in the trenches that were dug by the Thomas Kings, by the Mr. Greens, the renowned artists that have come from these lands, from our peoples, from indigenous peoples. And in recognizing that we're in someone else's territories and, and having the ceremony that we've had, this really is the point of entry, expressions of respect to the original and current inhabitants and to the ancestors, mine and yours, who gathered on the land, who made promises to one another, as John had alluded to. Promises to work together for our collective well-being. And may I say how fitting it is at this moment, as Lee had said to me before we started, that we're on the cusp, because it feels like that. It feels like we've arrived at a moment, perhaps, of unprecedented engagement, awareness, challenge, and opportunity for First Nations peoples, and indeed for all of Canada. And as you know, and as was shared here already, LaFontaine La and Baldwin came together in the mid-1800s in the midst of chaos, in the midst of rebellion. Wasn't described necessarily as the, using the word conflict. But I know that uh, Graham Greene last night when we were, were talking, I think he used the term string theory, right? Wasn't that what he was talking about? There you are, sir. String theory. And, and the way you're talking, even smaller than the atoms. This is the way my father speaks to me as well. The way you were reminding us about, in our language, we would say, the interconnected, the interconnected aspect of all life. And the essence of life being everywhere was what I received from what you had said. And that idea of this notion of something being created out of chaos, out of, at that time, rebellion. And that this country, in fact, and this, the idea of this lecture series, John, from what I'm hearing, from what you were describing, very much being based on that. And the idea of the Institute of Citizenship. I want to touch on a few of these ideas. Talk about the kinds of philosophy that was introduced, Mr. Green, in, in your reflections with your fellow panelists at dinner last night, for those of us who were there. So it feels like a very fitting moment. Like was said, uh, the last six months or the last 12 months are the few times that I've been able to get away with not shaving, for example. <laughs> this is not my five o'clock shadow. It takes a West Coaster a long time to get to this point. <laughs> and so today, um, behind the force of a, a little bit of facial growth, I want to take the opportunity to offer up a challenge to respectfully and with great love reflect back and as we do to our loved ones, confront one another periodically when we have some things that, that are on our hearts and on our minds. I, I do believe that we can un uncover powerful new ways to appreciate citizenship and to unleash success. And it does require a bit of contextual framing, always to think about what was as a way to appreciate what is at this moment, as a way for us to then shape together as Tara might do in her, in her plays as she's writing, to script what might be. And this is a moment to ask that we do this together. And it does require us to go back further to the early 1600s, to the two-row wampum, to treaties of peace and friendship, to 1763 and the Royal Proclamation by King George III, and we know another little King George has just been born. 
I sent some Manitoba mucklucks. <laughs> under strict instruction by a strong Mohawk woman, I might add. And the Treaty of Niagara in 1764, and forward through relationships that have been set out in treaty, very unique around the world. Canada is unique in this respect. Agreements and understandings right across this country. These agreements must not be viewed as antiquated relics of history, something just to be left. Yes, they are fundamental to understanding our collective past, but they're increasingly important to understanding how we can achieve our potential as a society today and into the future. This is because the approach used by our mutual ancestors, yours and mine, to forge these agreements was based on recognition, on respect and mutual understanding. These are the principles that we must again embrace and apply to clear a new path forward. Understanding concepts of identity and citizenship in this land that we now call Canada means that we must strive to fulfill what was originally intended. This is central to the success of Canada today, and in fact, quite possibly, it offers universal lessons the world over. And so we begin with some sweeping historical references. It is one of the great tragedies of the teachings of history in this country that this history too often begins only with the arrival of Europeans. So too, I was taught. Thereby denying all of our students the rich, powerful, and important chronicle of the indigenous societies, governments, and peoples of this land. Given our limitations today, that's the first challenge, to encourage all of you and Canada, those listening in, to di dig deeper than what we can cover here today. Thankfully, there are tremendous new academic works from indigenous scholars that are making a major contribution to our collective understanding, and I'm very pleased to say that we're beginning to see changes in the school system as well writings the likes of which John has authored, Truths About Canada, Fair Country. I should start getting a cut of that <laughs> piece there. Or in our midst, we have one of the, if not the first, Indigenous man appointed president of a charter university in Canada, Mike Degonier, sitting over there. Please stand up and be acknowledged. The very earliest interactions between indigenous peoples and Europeans within the territories of what is now Canada were characterized, for the most part, by mutual interest and respect. Relationships established based on recognition and respect through commercial and military alliance and treaty are the bedrock and the foundation upon which Canada is built. In fact, prior to contact with Europeans, there were extensive trade networks and treaty-making practices among indigenous nations. European traders who arrived in the northern part of North America had to learn and adopt these practices to establish a place for themselves and many instances to survive. The two-row wampum of 1613 remains one of the most vivid and important examples. The belt, now exactly 400 years old, records in expertly crafted precious purple and white shells the treaty between the Iroquois and the Dutch. The belt depicts the wake of two vessels, a First Nations canoe and a European sailing ship, traveling together side by side, yet on parallel paths, uninhibited by each other. It captures the commitment to an ongoing relationship of autonomous nations linked to one another by the principles of truth, respect, and friendship, being friendly to one another. Two row wampum symbolizes a strong ethical relationship between two nations and two peoples. Some of the other earliest observations of European negotiators recorded and reported conclusions noting that, and I quote here, there is no end to the relations with the Indians. Yes, we sometimes pull that term out. For example, I am not the Prime Minister of Indians in Canada. I'll come back to that point later. Reflecting an intrinsic tie to the peoples, to their lands, and to the importance of agreements and relationships. The earliest treaties from the East followed the path set in wampum, treaties of peace and friendship. Yet we must never overlook the reality that those concepts in the treaties included economic and strategic imperative. 
This is perhaps best stated by a representative of Six Nations to the governor of New York in the early 1700s when he summed up their interests by stating, and I quote, trade and peace we take to be one thing. The Royal Proclamation of 1763, in part, a statement of the rights of indigenous nations, a statement no doubt hastened by several successful First Nations battles. The Royal Proclamation reflects on successful alliances and treaties of peace and friendship and affirms treaty making as a requirement for development. The proclamation led directly to the Treaty of Fort Niagara in 1764, creating a new covenant chain between the British Crown and the First Nations in the Great Lakes area. The Treaty of Fort Niagara establishes a continuous relationship of peace, friendship, and respect between the indigenous nations and the Crown. You see all the more important that Her Excellency would receive a name, the likes of which she did, the grandmother of many nations from Treaty 7 territory, a very powerful link to the crown that exists to this day. Wamp wampum belts were presented and exchanged at, at that time. Over a two-month period, Indigenous leaders made speeches, as we are wont to do periodically, and conducted ceremony affirming their understanding of the relationship. We come from oral societies, remember. This year, 400 years since the two-row wampum, in fact, October 7th of this year, would mark the anniversary, the 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation. It's an important opportunity to remember the principles of peace, friendship, and especially recognition, being central to the original engagement of our earliest political, economic, and yes, military agreements. And of course, as I've alluded to with the 52 languages, we are incredibly diverse. I coming from the village of Ahauzit, which roughly translates as people who come from the sea, back to the land, back to our backs or to the, uh, the coastal mountain range, and next stop, like I said, Japan. We're people of the ocean. And it's evident in the way that we describe ourselves as nations and, and even the terms that we use the language as with any culture around the globe. Our citizenship then, that notion of identity is intrinsically tied to our territories. My people are people of the sea. And when I was five or six years old, it was made abundantly clear as I'd be off, I had my dried fish in this pocket and I had my fishing line in this pocket and I was as any kid heading down to go fishing for the day. But the aunties would stop me, always the aunties. <laughs> waggling their finger, did you go see your grandma today? Oh, well, I'm going fishing. Oh, okay, I guess I better. And they would then stop and make sure that I understood the necessity to sit with my grandmothers, with my great aunts, and to learn through the stories about our people and about the responsibilities that we will inherit. And, and that was very early on in life. Hearing concepts, the likes of which Mr. Green alluded to in his reflection, he shook me, we are all one. Tzawak. That's an easy one. You can say it with me. Go ahead. Zawak. There, you spoke in my language. It means one. Oneness. Oneness. He shook me. Zawak. We are all one and interconnected. Beginning to get to the roots of what I'm hearing are the underpinnings of the lecture series and the, the very notion of this country and concepts like pluralism. We are definitely a very rich and complex society, just as New Channel. There's about 15,000 of us now, growing rapidly fastest growing segment of the Canadian population, but we are one of 52 different languages. There's 32 different languages just in British Columbia. The pattern of contact was different where I come from on the West Coast and happened somewhat later, but again we see the emergence of similar principles and lessons, remembering also that our early history was not without conflict. In the late 1700s, Spanish, British, Russian, and American ships began sailing the Northwest Coast. Our peoples generally welcomed the opportunity to expand our trading networks, but we're also absolutely clear, as my people especially are, about jurisdictions, about our rights and about our responsibilities. Acts of aggression by Europeans were met with a fierce response by our peoples, probably with facial hair like this. In northern BC, the Tlingit fought against Russian occupation and successfully defended their people and territories. In Haida Gwaii and Vancouver Island, many European ships were attacked and destroyed in the assertion of indigenous territory. Indeed, my own nation captured and destroyed ships that were illegally harvesting in our territories, disregarding and disrespecting our laws. And as a child with a butter knife, I used to be out on the rocks adjacent to the 
my village down the beach, and I used to find coins from the 1500s from Spain. And an outsider would come visit, and there'd be a horde of us kids that would sell this guy our coin for 25 cents. <laughs> because then you could get Petru at the store. I've see, since seen examples of those coins in the Caribbean. And I only knew the link when the dance, the Kingfisher, would come out and be sung and would be danced. One of our most famous songs and dances in my village performed even during the time when the potlatches were out loud because we were sneaky. Instead of having our cedar boards up where we'd use as a screen on a stage just like this, we may started making them out of canvas so you could hide them really quickly, tuck them away, and then just pretend that we weren't doing anything. <laughs> you know, the Indian agents would come and they'd put our people to jail. So that's my little snippet about a moment where I didn't really fully grasp but got through our stories and our songs and our dances, this notion of conflict, which our our people commemorate through our potlatch and through our songs and through our dances. Part of this history includes this resistance, war, and then, of course, devastating loss of life from imported diseases. Battles ensued on the coast and inland where the Chilcotin, a name that you may be hearing more of in the press these days, in the interior of British Columbia, and others waged war to oppose road construction that was occurring without their participation. This was happening at approximately the same time as mining expeditions were beginning along the north shore of Lake Superior, where I was just last week, back here in the east, under the leadership of the famous Anishinaabe chief Shingwakons, The Anishinaabek stood in firm defense, demanded fairness. They, in fact, demanded treaty, as they had heard about and seen happening further south and had known as well amongst our own nations. You see, like was described at the outset, like this very country, at moments of conflict, there are clear choices. In this country where we establish successful, sustainable relations, we have agreed to respect one another. We agreed that we have mutual interests. We agreed to fairness, to sharing, and to support one another. These principles, codified in the treaties and embedded as well in our ongoing relationship, are now the foundation and basis of the relationship between First Nations and the Crown now Canada. They bind us in a unique partnership secured when our ancestors agreed to peacefully coexist in mutual respect and to share the lands and the wealth of the traditional territories. First Nations and all Canadians share this history and we're connected as we embark on this collective future. Put simply, it means there is no outsider. We are each and every one of us all involved and we must all be engaged. The treaties and other agreements are not only about rights, they are absolutely also about responsibilities. Within the Indigenous worldview, sharing is a central natural law that requires us to develop protocols of mutual understanding and respect to keep balance, to seek harmony of the whole. Not only between and amongst people, but I learned as a kid to go fishing didn't mean it was the prowess of being a fisher, but you sang the song to the fish, ash, posh, tulip tulip, because you have treaty with the fish too. It has to agree to grab on to that which you put out in order for it to be brought in to become food. John was complaining about not being a good fisher, so I've just offered up a fishing tip. <laughs> that one's for free. This notion of sharing, of having an understanding of mutual, uh, having a basis upon which you have mutual understanding and respect we can illustrate, I'd like to offer up a couple of illustrations. Some of you may have um, picked up on the recent media where there was really, for us, it was a, f a flash fire of media reports about biomedical testing that was conducted by the government of Canada on children attending residential school. Not a revelation that was entirely shocking to many of us who grew up hearing not just whispers, but real stories at our dinner tables with our parents and our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. But the reports had the effect of really tearing open and into open old wounds. It's, per, it's perhaps a perfect as well as terrible example of what happens when there is no respect or real recognition of peoples. Ripping apart families, apprehending children as they crawled under the bed or ran into the bush to try and save themselves, trying to forcibly imprint an, an alien language, as my father witnessed five and six-year-olds having pins pricked into their tongue when they tried to speak the only language that they could when they arrived at these schools. Really 
children faced with trying to save themselves and their culture and a people trying to save their culture and their spirituality. Nothing less than the prolonged abuse of the most vulnerable is what occurred. This abuse was not the exception. This was official federal policy. We all know the tragic consequences of these actions, a legacy that continues to have a devastating effect on our nations today. And this is where the professional becomes personal. These are stories I heard at my dinner table. It being explained to me that some kids got vitamins and vitamin C and oranges and some kids didn't and it wasn't understood. We can't ask a seven or eight year old to understand that that was the case. And it just turns out that Mike's uh, former role was with the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And you get why I'm excited about the fact that he's now president of an important university in the country. It's that, it's that notion that, that education, learning, and understanding, which is really the underlying theme of this uh, reflection I'd like to offer, is so critical. And why looking back to understand what was is how we arrive at a better shared notion of what is right now. Then we can get on with shaping the future together. The historic apology then of 2008 was absolutely essential, and I was there. I was in the house when it was uttered. And so now, too, is the time of truth and reconciliation. Acts of reconciliation create tremendous opportunity for all First Nations peoples and for all Canadians to join in the efforts of understanding we need to begin again building our shared future. I can't help but be thankful for this being just such a moment where voices are included that haven't perhaps been included in, in this manner and this being a historic moment and in, the, in the midst of an artistic festival, I think it really adds to it. Fortunately, my second illustration, moving off that first one from a recent news, tells just such a story. We saw the recent massive flooding in Alberta. I don't know if anyone was there. I was there. You too, me too. I was downtown Calgary and the waters were rising. It's like, wow. And it was capturing the headlines, Calgary was. But a number of First Nations communities in Treaty 7 territory were also hit hard by the rising waters. And I had the opportunity as part of my role to travel to these communities three times during the crisis. And it's really quite overwhelming to witness this kind of natural disaster in person, for sure. Talking to the families from Tutina, from Morley, Siksika, people devastated by their losses and facing a very uncertain future. Yet what was most remarkable was seeing the incredible courage and the kindness of a community come together. Hearing about people checking in on one another, on their friends and on their neighbors, making sure the elders and the children, those most vulnerable, were cared for and were safe. And the volunteerism, people flooding into the arenas at these reserves I'm talking about, from all over, from the reserve itself and from outside the community. People helping to keep each other's spirits strong at a time of crisis. Material possessions, of course, being swept away by the rising water, but the spirit never lost. And it's the spirit that the chiefs and their citizens harnessed to get the support they needed in Treaty 7. Far too often, situations like this have left people vulnerable and needy for far too long. Lost because of the tangled web of jurisdictional overlaps and uncertainties that we still have today. Not this time. This was different. To their credit, the provincial government joined the First Nations leadership immediately, followed closely by the federal government. Within days of impact, we had ministers and representatives from all governments across many ministries directly engaged with the leadership to put the needs of the people first. A time of crisis when everyone needs one another. The barriers and the gaps that block action were overcome, seemingly melted in front of all of our eyes. The same lesson can absolutely apply more broadly to the work that we need to do now. The full agenda requires that everyone come together, just as Treaty 7 pulled First Nations and their neighbors together to deal with the rising water. And one of the Treaty 7 elders said when we were in the meeting with the various ministers and officials, this is treaty, he said. He commented about what was actually happening. This is what's required to do. We need to come together among our own nations and with the governments to honor and respect our obligations in treaty to support one another. You see, we have inherent responsibilities to our lands, our waters, and our peoples. And we have inherent rights as nations to work in full respect with one another as equal partners in other governments. The medical experiments that I mentioned earlier are really part of a larger continuum of socioeconomic and policy experiments that have all failed our people. 
This includes the Indian Act, an attempt to really displace overnight the ways of life that had been in place for generations, tried to wipe away the promises and treaty that we would respect one another and share that we would not impose one way of life over another. All of these experiments have been utter and abject failures. The experiments are all part of an unacceptable pattern that we must all work to break. The realities and stats are stark and they are absolutely sobering. Canada ranking within the top five in the UN Human Development Index while First Nations fall well below and struggle alongside countries in the developing and third world. Our people are, as I witnessed firsthand, and some are beginning to appreciate now because of increased awareness in this country, crammed into crumbling homes and collapsing communities. Almost half of our children live in poverty. Our children, and this is a fact, are right now statistically more likely to end up in jail than to graduate from high school. The reality of attempted denial, of extinguishment and displacement makes it difficult to even feel part of Canada, part of the whole today. I've experienced this reality directly myself as we fought and won a major fisheries case amongst the new channel. The court, the judge brought the court to my village and I sat with my regalia in front of my people in my village and a lawyer for the Crown said to me directly, we do not recognize that you exist as a peoples. Those words were uttered to me, of course, in a moment of deep and direct conflict, but make no mistake, that Crown lawyer is speaking for Canadians when that Crown lawyer is representing Canada in a case on fisheries in my little village off the west coast. But like the over 40 other court cases that, we, that I can point to, we won this court case. And this is really about persistence, and in this case, succeeding. But it doesn't mean that when you win a court case against the federal government that the next day it's implemented the way you expected. <laughs> this is where you come in. Just as we have, as Neutronal, finally concluded this 10-year legal battle for recognition of our fishing rights, we must find the way forward for all of us based on recognition and respect. This means we all have work to do. First Nations are becoming fully engaged in this effort by driving forward solutions from the ground up. Working together, respecting one another and supporting one another will lift us all up and it makes economic sense as well. It makes political sense. It makes moral sense, just as it did in the time of treaty. Mutual respect, recognition and partnership. This is how we can move forward together to break this pattern of unilateral imposed approaches that are absolutely failing, not just us, but the entire country. So this means that all of Canada has a tremendous and a shared stake in renewing and reconciling our relationship. Our ancestors did it, and we can as well. In fact, we must do it. This is required to meet our mutual interests and to achieve mutual success. And this, I feel, is the economic imperative for the entire country. As I said earlier, our population, this makes me an old timer, are the youngest and fastest growing population, over half under the age of 25. Tremendous potential in our peoples and our communities. We must invest in First Nations people through education, through skills training and employment opportunities to ensure that First Nations are full participants in the economy. A study by the Center for the Study of Living Standards found that if we raise First Nations educational and employment levels so they're equal with the rest of Canada, this will add 400 billion to the Canadian economy and save $115 billion in government expenditures. It's clear that our people are key to keeping Canada sustainable and strong. So are our lands. In the coming years, Canada is planning more than 500 major resource projects that would represent $650 billion in new investments, all, almost all which will be on or near First Nations land or territories. For any of this to proceed, clear conditions must first be met. The approaches must be sustainable and responsible, and they must respect and recognize our treaty rights, our title, and our reality. This means then that we must design new approaches that ensure recognition and an ongoing relationship for stewardship and decision making that reflects the jurisdictions of all peoples. It means that principles which are in place enshrine the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that include the right to free prior and informed consent are the basis upon which we engage early and often. 
then we can all share in the economic benefits. The benefits of working with First Nations to give life to our rights and support our solutions is being recognized more and more in this country by influential groups like the Canadian Council of Chief Executives who reported in July of last year on the opportunity among First Nations to develop a skilled and trained workforce which would in turn create economic spin-offs and capacity building at the community level. The same report makes clear recommendations on the benefits of recognizing rights and effective meaningful partnerships with First Nations. It echoes what we as First Nations have been saying for decades. I should add the Canadian Chamber of Commerce placing in the top 10 the list of barriers to competitiveness, the need for skills training amongst the Indigenous peoples of this country as well. This takes us back to the early days of emerging economic and trade patterns. I was thinking about, uh, John, the book by Hackett Fisher, Champlain's Dream, being another excellent example of writings recently that begin to capture this sentiment about the early days economic and trade patterns in fisheries and in the fur trade. And we see that, once again, our nations are an important part of the economic life of this country, vital players and partners in keeping the country strong and competitive. First Nations, and particularly our young people, have a growing confidence, determination and conviction, and we're high-tech Indians. Social media, some of the highest users per capita of social media, Indigenous young people. Information moves as quick as lightning now about what's happening in Ottawa or maybe a lecture for some at Stratford. <laughs> the information moves incredibly fast right now and it is very helpful to our people and to expanding the conversation and including many in this notion of the resurgence and strengthening of our people, the strengthening of First Nations governments, of nation building, we refer to it, and rebuilding and the development of our own economies. First Nations are driving forward solutions, enabling their citizens and youth become, to become actors, actors for a civil and just society, and agents of positive change in their communities and far beyond. But we need not act alone in our efforts to fulfill our true potential as peoples, as partners, and as nations. We all have a role to play in realizing this opportunity. For after all, no one of us in this room, no one of us in this country, created this current malaise. Nor unto our own did any of us break the promises of treaty. But still, and yet still, we can all take responsibility for sparking change. For as has been famously said, and John himself makes this reference, we are all treaty people. We're all part of the Crown First Nations relationship that were and remain central to Canada. We're all product of the partnerships built on respect and recognition, and we can live the vision of the ancestors and act today for a better tomorrow. Indeed, there is absolutely, and I see this all the time, an incredible amount of work to do. I was reminded, uh, my father is one of the first in our, perhaps in, uh, in Western Canada, but for sure amongst the New Channel, and the first at the University of British Columbia, he went and got three degrees. He said his grandfather had caught three whales. I come from a whaling lineage, and his three whales were his three degrees the very first First Nations man from the University of British Columbia to attain a PhD, and he did that in his 50s. He's now 74. It just reminds us that while we've come a long way and we have over 30,000 post-secondary graduates, that's a recent history that I'm talking about. We have our first university president sitting here. I just talked about a man who achieved our first PhD, and John often references the over 30,000 post-secondary, educated Indigenous peoples across our lands. And there's a lot of work to do. We have come some ways. And my dad reminded me when I was having trouble with math, I said, Dad, I don't understand this algebra. I can't do it. You can have what you say, son. Oh, drove me crazy. I said that I couldn't, and what he was saying was, you can have what you say. The moment you believe it's possible, you're making the choice to do the hard work. He would say there's the hard way or the harder way son. And this is where we find ourselves at at this juncture as well. It's, it seems that we've been avoiding the hard work for a long, long time, but not anymore. We're not going to allow this to be punted down to future generations and choose what's ultimately the harder path. Oh. 
Our efforts absolutely require us to come together to find solutions. Achieving full engagement and forging understanding is the standard of how we can and must do business together. Our guiding principle is the shared commitment for First Nations to be full participants in designing a collective future for our communities and the country as a whole. First Nations are doing our, our work and we extend our hand to you just as we did at the time of treaty. We're reaching out to parliamentarians and provincial and territorial leaders. We're reaching out to the private and public sector, reaching out to the international community and absolutely reaching out to artistic, our artistic leadership. We're reaching out to Canadians from all walks of life and all faiths to join us in this national project, this new national dream to create a more fair, a just, and a stronger Canada. And I'm pleased and proud to say that more and more Canadians are standing with us every day. They're supporting our efforts to improve education, our economies, housing, health, and community safety. In my role as National Chief, as I alluded to earlier, my role is not to direct First Nations. My job is to empower, to support their voices, advocate for a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship. My role is to support and advocate for respect and recognition of First Nations' rights, title, and treaties. To press for the transformative change that's required for First Nations to fulfill their true potential. My role, indeed, is that of a facilitator for direct discussion and dialogue between First Nations governments, the likes of which was an example for Treaty 7 during the time of the flooding. Canada is built on a proud heritage of strong, vibrant Indigenous nations and our historic and living relationships with one another. And together we can build strong communities where our peoples are full participants in driving our economies, educating our youth, and fostering strong First Nations governments. And as I move to, towards concluding, I want to bring us all back to the great themes of the LaFontaine Baldwin Lectures, that we must grasp the overarching themes so that we can focus on the specific plans of action, programs for change, and tasks for each and every one of us. I'm reminded of the words of Prime Minister Trudeau when he left office in 1978. He acknowledged with some frustration and regret, and I quote, despite our attempts, the Indian problem is still with us. 35 years later, after successive governments, both liberal and conservative, it's time for a new language and a new story. A story that's not about the Indian problem, but of recognition and of dialogue. Harold Cardinal, a Cree scholar and contemporary of Pierre Trudeau, responded to the failed policy program of the late 60s with his important work entitled The Unjust Society. He outlined thoughtful solutions organized around the theme of increased First Nations control of First Nations affairs based on recognition. All of these components being key to citizenship and key to belonging. The same themes emerged when the National Indian Brotherhood, which is the direct predecessor of the Assembly of First Nations, released the important policy statement called Indian Control of Indian Education in 1972. Another call to recognize our authority and responsibility to educate our own children in our languages and cultures and to nurture their success in today's world. The massive five-volume report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples from 1996 rec recounts the same challenges and sets out the same solutions in clear and comprehensive terms, and it was a report also born out of crisis and conflict. You'll recall the time of the Oka crisis, as it's often referenced as. Yet we still struggle to grab hold of these solutions or worse, complain that we don't know what to do. As I did say earlier, we are making progress, but we must dramatically increase the rate and pace of the change. This to me compels new understanding and broader engagement, the engagement of all of us. Canada needs a new story. Canada is more than two founding nations. Canada is more than a multicultural mosaic. Canada is more than a nation of immigrants. Canada is a country built on a proud heritage of strong, vibrant Indigenous nations. Canada is built on the fundamental foundation of partnership. Canada's legal and political traditions are founded in pluralism and respectful partnership forged for both peace and prosperity. This new story is connected to a very old one by the thread of collective history and collective memory. It's a story of proud nations celebrating a strong voice of belonging and citizenship through their knowledge, languages, traditions, and an abiding respect for the environment, trade, and alliances of governing, of governing systems that respect the rights of all. Our new story eclipses, overcomes for once and for all, the failed attempts of assimilation, 
and the outrageous denial of the rights of indigenous peoples. This new story, our new story, embraces the dream of our ancestors, yours and mine. The dream of the two-row wampum, of canoes traveling side by side, never interfering with each other's path. The dreams of the original treaties of peace and friendship, the dreams of the early explorers who imagined a society of partnership, the dreams of indigenous leaders who sought to protect their citizens, their territories, and their way of life. As citizens, we are more than individuals. We're something far greater, something more complex and precious. We are connected, he shook walk to one another, to our past, and absolutely, if we choose, to our future. We are called to be active participants in achieving our promise of respect, reconciliation, and sharing this is the promise of treaty. As I say in my language, he shook walk, we are all one. Recognition requires that we see one another, that we dialogue and understand one another with humility and with respect. Canada's constitution, the decisions of the Supreme Court, and countless studies set the framework for our new story. I recall fondly having been in the House of Commons with my late grandmother. She was 87 at the time, holding her hands as we sat and listened to the statement of apology. And she turned to me and she said, grandson, they are just beginning to see us. Scholars the world over find that a refusal to grant recognition to indigenous peoples provokes resentment and hostility. Further alienation of them from their identity as citizens with the larger state, we can be resolute, if we choose, in setting a better path, just as our ancestors did. A path where recognition of indigenous rights become the very source of pride of citizenship and identity. We take pride, rightfully so, in Canada's great traditions of peacemaking and serving peace. Peace is created through recognition, through living with humility in order to see the other. It's an approach needed between peoples, indeed between nations, between mankind and the natural world around us. Now it's up to all of us to do our part, to be active participants in writing this story. The inspirations to act are legion, as I hope to that I have begun, just begun to illustrate for you today. So let us recall, again, the words of Indigenous leaders enter, entering into alliance. Trade and peace we take to be one thing. And so let me add, recognition and harmony we take to be one thing. Prosperity and balance we take to be one thing. It is through understanding that we can learn to see one another to recognize our shared interests and realize the conditions for peace and prosperity. Collectively, I feel strongly that we have in this moment the ability. We have, and our young people have the energy. We have the ideas. Now is our time to be the authors of this new story and turn the page to new tomorrow together. Tleko, tleko. Thank you so much. Is that a political question? <laughs> Left or the right? <laughs> it's always so tricky. 
<laughs> Just got everybody responding so beautifully. I could do it. We could do it one more time. There's that that uh, pub, bit of public rhetoric that you hear so often in Western Canada and very rarely in Central Canada, which is this idea of everybody's involvement. The treaties are signed by two sides, not one side. It's not the it's not the Indians who signed the treaties. It's all of us who signed the treaties. And so in, if, how many Westerners are in the audience? Uh, then you all know it, so you can lead. So the, question, the public question is, who are the treaty people? We are the treaty people. Who are the treaty people? We are the treaty people. There you are. It's very simple. Oh, I, I, now you have to do something about it. <laughs> so we have two mics. We have very little time. We have two mics. I see one there. There must be one over there. there. And we'll just uh, take four questions at once, if you don't mind, if there are people who want to line up. So don't sit around in that Canadian way thinking about, I, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be first. Two and two here. We'll take them, and then the national chief will uh, respond at once to all four of them. So they're just it, a wise. It would, it would <laughs> seem from the conversation that we've had and from the talk that you've just given us, Sean, that our leaders over the course of a long period of time have been speaking out of two sides of their mouths or have spoken out of one side of their mouth and have had huge frustrations at accomplishing what they say we all want to accomplish in our world. So give us some concrete things that we can do rather than just getting in our cars and going home and moaning about it on the way home. Great. What's our next step? Great. Ma'am. Uh, at the Kuchichin Conference earlier this week, Roberto Jameson asked us to support INSPIRE. INSPIRE has a D in it, and it's to support education of Aboriginal people. I wondered if you could comment on that. And also, a professor of law in Saskatchewan told us it's important for us to get out of the way when we need to. Could you tell us more about what that means? You mean for non-Aboriginals to get out of the way? Yes. Yeah, okay. Ma'am. Uh, you spoke of, of uh, social media, and I, I mentioned that to say that uh, after watching the Eighth Fire documentaries, I had um, found myself in a Twitter conversation with a few folks, and I found myself being asked by uh, those who in some way speak for some Indigenous peoples in Canada what I thought our next step would be. And I realized that as a settler, no one had ever asked me. Uh, and I'm curious about responsibility uh, for those of us who are settlers and, and who engage as treaty people in, in these sorts of relationships, how we... Uh, reframe the discussion so that we are and, and that we can talk about the ways in which we are part of that relationship in a way that is respectful and that doesn't, doesn't repeat those historical trends of just taking over. Hello, Sean. Um, uh, I think it was about, oh, it was right in Christmas, right just before Christmas. We were um, at uh, uh, Ministry of Natural, or we were in, in Queen's Park and you and I were talking and outside uh, the Idle No More movement was just starting. And I remember you looked me in the eye and you said, it's, it's starting. It's out there, they're talking, and we're, in here, we're here talking, it's beginning. And uh, um, my, one of my passions is, uh, is, is my organization, Dare Arts. And, um, and one of our big thing is igniting that change within not only Aboriginal um, youth and kids, but doing the bridging between them and non-Aboriginal youth and kids in urban and rural areas. Um, what are your thoughts on how uh, we can make those bridges stronger and earlier in the education system so that in, you know, say in Toronto, um, kids in grade four learn about about the, all the different languages and the different nations and the different treaties and agreements that we have in this country so that it's, it's ingrained in them at an earlier age. And I have a present for you. I gave one to you, John, yesterday. Yes. <laughs> and this one's for you. Wonderful. You... Great. National Chief, do you want to weave that together into... Sure. Uh... I will weave away. <laughs> I will weave away. And uh, say, click go for this. For this. Kind gift. Will Allen. Will um, Coming from Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq. Will Allen. Will Allen. Thank you. And Will Allen and uh, Mi'kmaq. I said Kleko and around here. What are the words, uh, Lee? Where are you? What's the words here? Yawa. Yawa. And Miigwech for the Anishinaabe. 
All meaning thank, all meaning thank you. So let go in my language. I will weave away really quickly. Uh, I sort of want to um, sort of want, want to begin in a way that maybe links a little bit to the eighth fire. I had tears unabashedly rolling down my cheek uh, when I saw the eighth fire. Uh, just like moments of pride when you see Mr. Uh, Green with intelligence uh, reflecting back to us that unlike what we were maybe told, uh, we have genius amongst our people. We have just as much potential for foolishness, but we also have potential for genius. And to, to be in the room last night and to, to get again today with Mr. Green, and I don't know if Mr. King is here, but Thomas King's writings, for example, and Terry, you probably feel this way because you talked about being the, the one who's received this this privilege to be in the trenches that were dug by others. Maybe they didn't know that they were digging them, and they don't, we don't need to worry about whether that's how they feel, because we're receiving what they've gone through. I'm talking about my parents' generation. I'm talking about you guys were all teasing one another about being older, and Tara and I are of the generation where we're watching, and we've watched what's happened, and now this gets to be, this is our turn. And at Queen's Park, uh, you know, we were saying it's happening right now. Um, Lee was reflecting back that we're on the cusp of something. There's something here that's happening. And I wanted to make the link with the arts ever so briefly as a way to weave all four reflections because one of the first things my father helped me understand was that some of the perspectives that we're describing that have weaved their way into Canadian law that would compel governments to send a crown lawyer into the courtroom or forge the Indian Act or to this very day or the work that we're doing uncovering and peeling back this uh, misinformation that's been around for so long. Back in Shakespeare's day, there was no CNN, social media, Twitter. There was the genius of Shakespeare. Some of it was injurious to our people. The depiction of Caliban in The Tempest being an example of the power of the arts to describe a people's carte blanche without intelligence scaly, human-like figure, but without the capacity and the spirit of a human. But Shakespeare's, the depiction of that character changed, didn't it, over time as well, dramatically, to the point where I saw a whole cast of Indians doing Shakespeare in Ottawa recently. Now that was turning it right on its head. And I loved it. I loved it. So I wanted to express what I have such a difficult time expressing and that is the power of artistic leadership to help find and weave that space between the heart, the mind, the soul, the intellect in society. Because we have it. I can't hold a potlatch or a feast without going to our artistic, spiritual leaders. And so, too, is this such a privilege to be here because of that very point. And, and I, I feel compelled to express that to, um, to Tara and uh, her, her fellow panelists uh, that, um, that you sat with last night. And for those who weren't there, it was, it was just a conversation about identity. And it was just wonderful to hear, uh, Mr. Green, how you just reflected back. Um, and you said it publicly, and so you pr probably won't give me too much trouble for reflecting back that one point. So get tired of explaining all the time. And maybe begin there, if I could respectfully request. Uh, seek out that understanding. We have now increasing numbers of writers like um, Thomas King, uh, buy his book too. Buy your book too, but buy, buy his book too. Absolutely. The Inconvenient Indian. It's a great book. It's a great book. All right, so real, real quickly then. Um, Mr. Wise, uh, to your point about the leaders. Um, leaders are also elected by Canadians, which is why I'm speaking with you and this audience and anyone who will listen online. Canadians put uh, people in office at all levels. Canadians can speak to their MPs and their MLAs. They can write letters. You can stand with the Roberta Jamesons and support Inspires. We would welcome your support. When John Ralston Saul writes an article, as was published yesterday in the Globe and Mail, when I got on the flight to come this way from the West Coast, I said to him, it's like a cooling solve on a burning wound when we hear influential. You don't have to agree with everything that John says. That's why... <laughs> That's why this, this, you know, the theme here is to be irreverent and thought-provoking, and we hope to contribute to that today. But let me thank you for that. That was a beautifully written article. Thank you. And it was helpful for opening up the space. It's not about saying this is what the solutions are. 
It's about saying what's required, and he's been saying it for a long time, is we need a new conversation. So, Mr. Wise, in the same way you asked me, I would turn right back around and ask you and your lovely wife, you know, and your family uh, to have conversations about how to reach out, how to understand, maybe to spend time reaching out to First Nations and asking questions. The eighth fire and, and you know, the, the notion of the next step, we've made it very clear. Two meetings in a row we've had with this Prime Minister. We've had meetings with former Prime Minister Paul Martin uh, in, a, in a, an event called the Kelowna Accord Talks in 05. And that is to put the topic of this discussion front and center. The implementation of the treaty relationship, it does require structural shifts. It could mean, for example, as has taken place in New Zealand, they have an independent tribunal to oversee implementation. So you have independent oversight. Because right now, the Department of Indian Affairs is both judge and jury on how or whether or not treaties, whether they're forged five years ago, after 20 years of negotiations with legions of lawyers dotting I's and crossing T's, and those communities are still finding themselves going to court against the government because the treaties are not being implemented in good faith. I hear the same argument from the Mi'kmaq people whose treaty has been there 400 years. So you see, we need a fundamental transformation in our relationship, and it may require a change in machinery of government. Ideas that are not new, that have been around since the Royal Proclamation, the ideas of a First Nations Auditor General, First Nations Ombudsperson. These are machinery concepts, uh, uh, perhaps Cabinet Committee. I'm, I'm not putting these as, as uh, my solutions for today. They do require the direct engagement. It's not about negotiations with Sean Atlio. It's about making sure that Treaty 3 in Northern Ontario with the Treaty Right to Education drives the implementation of that Treaty Right to Education. My job and what I'm reaching out to Canadians to do is the support for that to become a reality, given the history of, of the residential schools. The urban-rural divide is not one. It's one of many divisions that we did not create. On-off reserve, status, non-status. Those uh, who grew up with their language, those who didn't. Those who went to residential school and those who didn't. And so it's to help recognize that we get caught sometimes in Canadian divisions that, that we did not create. Linguistic, um, urban-rural divide. Uh, these are part of nation-state conversations that sometimes get lumped in. Well, just move down from northern Ontario into Toronto and it should be okay. The uh, Atawapiskat, our drummer, that's his home. I come from a house. It. That's where I belong. I know that's where I come from. The idea of exchanges. Let's make sure that we support teachers to teach in communities. If we need to forgive their loans to make sure that they stay five years in a community where there is such high turnover because they're in these rural isolated areas, let's find the incentives. I'd say in conclusion that this is about learning. This is about and the reason why education is the door to get through, to get to the housing, to get to the health and social and economic changes because education at its foundation, it's about worldview, it's about philosophy, it's about respect, it's about uh, understanding the facts of where we've come from, getting a sense of where we are now, and then being open to forging a new future together. And that, in, for me, and few of us have said that, that just the privilege to be here, offering that recognition, in some respects, the medium is part of the message, a powerful message of inclusion. And for that, I want to thank you, John and Madame Clarkson. And I want to thank those uh, at the Stratford Festival for the great privilege of being here to offer uh, a First Nations voice uh, here this morning. Thank you so much. I'm going to add well, two sentences to really uh, Mr. Wise's thing, which is I think that the National Chief gave you what I would call the, the structures of what you're supposed to do, which is when you said, you know, you sat in your village wearing your robes, and this lawyer using the Western English system came in and as part of the argument said you don't exist. Every time the Canadian government does something through any of its mechanisms, which are, is unacceptable, you're doing it. You are personally responsible for what that lawyer said. And so really what the National Chief, I think, has said to you is it's time that when you hear that a lawyer is standing up for the Canadian government doing this kind of thing, you have to say, we, don't, we won't vote for that. We won't agree with that. You know, it's, it's about you speaking up and um, being part of this, this conversation. So I want to say thank you to Stratford. I want to say thank you to Anthony and to Anita Gaffney for helping this whole thing happen. 
Uh, I want to say thank you to Kira for the incredible work uh, that you have done, and all the people from the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. Um, and of course, I want to say thank you to the National Chief for being here today and giving, I think, an amazing lecture, um, which we can all use. Uh, if you understand what a webcast is, go to it, <laughs> listen to it, uh, take part in the discussion which is happening there, and keep it going. Um, this whole symposium is built around conversation. We believe that culture, artists, ideas are the leadership mechanism of society. And you've come here and you've listened, and now you have to go out and talk and take part and keep this conversation going. Uh, 150 of us are going from here to the Marquee Restaurant, running to keep on time, uh, to have a lunch at round tables where we're going to talk about this. And I would encourage you, if you're not going to that, to find other ways of doing it. And then look for the lecturer next year. Uh, follow what the ICC in Stratford are saying about the LaFontaine Baldwin lecture in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, National Chief. Thank you.